guys, Mike Fisher here, MF Cashflow. I'm here today with Bruce Woolett, man, and this guy is out of one of my favorite cities ever. If you guys listen to me enough, you know I love the Phoenix area, and um, he was just teasing me that he's sitting in his shorts right now and and uh, t-shirt, and you know, I'm like, I call bullshit on this, but guys, this guy, it, he used to live in Chicago, and uh, I think it was like he said 20 years ago, he left, and in the Chicago area, area. Uh, he left, and I don't blame him for never coming back. Because this is, as you guys know, if you've not been to the Midwest, it's not a place that you go to and then leave and come back. You know, it's just, it's just not. So this guy's got a fantastic story. I, I really uh, can't wait for him to like peel it back and and just see where he came from. Um, I just met him, what, uh, maybe about a month ago or so at a conference in, uh, in, the, in the Loop area, and uh, he was speaking, and I just heard his story, and I thought, man, this, is, this guy's got a great story, and I think people need to hear his story. Uh, and then also just a, of what, what play he's making in the real estate market. And uh, it's interesting enough just having a conversation with him a few minutes before this, and he and I know similar people. So it's a it's a small world out there, and uh, but we can we can get to that later. Bruce, thank you so much for being a guest on the MF Cash Flow. You know, I like to say the Mike Fisher Cash Flow or the motherfucking Cash Flow, whatever works for you, man. But uh, you know, thank you so much, and and you know, just if you could just share a little bit about your story, Bruce. I I, I I'm kind of anxious for the for the audience to hear the story. Uh, blast it out, man. Well, I'll start with the name. You know, the name of the company is, is Bakerson. And I grew up in a bakery business in Minneapolis, uh, the Wallet Bakery, still in business there. And so I always tell people I'm, I'm an SOB. I'm a son of a baker. <laughs> and that gets a good chuckle. So like I said, I grew up in the bakery business and in honor of my father, uh, I named it Bakerson. And he really liked that. And then a few years after I uh, started my business, he had passed away. But in, in his honor, the, the, the legacy of his name lives on in our company name. Sweet. So that's why it's Bakerson. We're... Uh, and I tell I tease people we're still raising dough, so that's a <laughs> little, little fun with uh, play on words. But yeah, I um, like I say, I lived in Minneapolis and then Chicago, and then uh, worked my way down to Phoenix. I tried a few different uh, sales positions, uh, a couple different businesses, and then in two thousand um, in two thousand and one, I landed in real estate, chasing tax lien foreclosures with a friend Gary, who also has passed away, but he was my mentor in teaching real estate and how to really dig down and find owners and and find the owner talk to the owner was the mantra we had and we were always uh, pursuing that but with tax liens he was leaving a lot of money on the table and i said gary there's other ways i can buy this uh, property i read rich dad poor dad um, which is the frankly the only one of his books i really like the rest of them are good but rich dad poor dad was pretty eye-opening just conceptually and yeah. and get, made me think so we got into uh I got into buying houses and I bought some from Gary, my business partner at the time and said, Hey, I'm going to buy these ones myself, fixed them up and sold them. And then, uh, in 2002, I met a very good friend, Jack Martin. We got to talking and, and his dad worked for my grandfather in the Willette bakery in Minneapolis in the sixties. And so that's why we're both sons of bakers. And that's where the name came up. And, uh, so Jack and I started, I was finding more houses than Jack could ever fix it, fix because he was a contractor uh, and a partner. And so I, I was introduced to wholesaling in 2000, late 2002, 2003, four, five, six, wholesale, you know, 40, 50, 60 homes a year. And when I say wholesale, it wasn't the same as what other people do where you flip contracts. We did that, but a lot of them, we took them down, cleaned them up, made them ready for the, for the investor to come in and do their work, you know, do the trash outs and the, uh, do the board ups get rid of graffiti, clean all the weeds, make the city of uh, Phoenix was where we were, everything we were buying was city of Phoenix, made a city of Phoenix compliant, code compliant. Mm -hmm. And the people came in, they could see what they could do with it. And we turned a little machine on. And then uh, 2006, seven, we had some rentals, sold them all. And I was gonna be this big land, land baron developer. We secured a, a square mile of land by, a, by a, a private country club. And we were working with the owner and. Greg Norman was doing the design work. We were going to be some big shots. And, and well, 2007, eight happened. And yeah. I, was a little, I was a little late to the party. So I kind of held on to 10 until I finally just told the owners that I, that I secured the property with. I just gave, just deeded it back to them and said, hey, 
Um, this just isn't going to work. You guys can have your property. Uh, it's not going to be developed in this cycle, maybe not the next one, because it wasn't even worth the property taxes that were owed on it far out west of Peoria in Phoenix Metro. So that was our that that was the uh, the the scars that we still just barely getting through all that uh, psychologically, me, you know, mentally. It took a long time to get through that with the the, the, the capital we lost, seven digits each, um, as well as some investor capital. Um, the partners that came on board, you know, they the market happened. So yeah. then I got back into wholesaling in 2010, and boy, that was fun. 2012, we did 287 houses. Damn, dude. And uh, the, it was, uh, you know, 20, my, my mantra that I said is a house a day is all I ask. And there's 23 working days in a month. So our goal was 23 and we hit that and it was really exciting. In fact, we've surpassed that. Um, and awesome. the fun things that I, the things I missed, like one, one time we had seven escrows for purchase or sale in three different title companies on the same day. And that was so fun. And everybody else said, Bruce, you're, you're insane to have that going on. So um, we moved out of that and started flipping multifamily. Uh, wholesaled uh, apartment buildings, uh, 100, 200 unit buildings, uh, a 250 space mobile home park in Winkleman, which is out past Globe in the far east uh, or east of the valley, Phoenix Valley. Um, and then a motel right on Apache in Tempe. We flipped that motor motel. And then we thought, you know, there's opportunities here to make some money. So we set up our first yeah. uh, first property was a 64 unit, uh, 36th Street in, in Thomas in Phoenix. And the second one is 120 unit on 68th Avenue in Glendale. And then it went from there. We had 22 units, 16 unit. Um, and then Phoenix market was going like this. And our investors were not real excited about the margins. You know, what you're, you're, instead of buying it as a good deal today and, and selling it as a, as a good deal tomorrow, you're buying it and, and selling everything on pro forma numbers. Yeah. Even our Everything is on pro forma, and they're like, I'd like, I want actuals. If we base it on what is the actual potential today and what can it be tomorrow based on today's numbers? And it just, they didn't pencil. Well, looking back, every property we looked at in 2016, we could have paid full list and made a, made a lot of money on it, but you don't know that. I mean, 2020 right. hindsight, right? If we had that crystal ball. <laughs> so uh, I'm moving rather quickly through the time timeline, but then You're good. We went down into, uh, into Tucson and we were told that, you know, they don't like people from Phoenix. You, you, they, you're not, you're not going to be able to buy anything. It's a closed culture. And we said, that's fine. So we went down to the city, talked to them, talked to brokers, got to know the culture, got to know the people. And uh, the first property we bought, we named, renamed, um, it was Coventry Manor. We ch changed it to Vista de Catalina, which is very Tucson. And then people start falling in love with, uh, you know, what we're doing. And they said, you guys do care about the, the community. And so that's, that's where we went. We've done uh, nine nine projects in Tucson smallest was 12 largest hundred or largest was 87 and then or I'm sorry 80 unit and the next door is a 27 unit um, it's it's uh, Tuscany village or Tuscany and we've combined those two to 107 units because they're all contiguous on the same block we own the whole block and that was an escrow to sell that's pretty exciting uh, so that's real quick the story yeah. from baking yeah. to to where we're at right yeah, now with multifamily and just uh a little bit on that. We went from the 18 to 36 month cycle and now we're looking at how can we do it by long term. And so we're going to be very careful ones we buy. They have to be good price per pound because it's uh, is now the best time to buy and hold. It can be, but you got to buy right. And we know about buying right. We had, I think it's going to be from July till now. So it's August, September, October, November, 16 months between closings on properties. We made four, over 40 offers before we got one accepted. Wow. And so that's, uh, it, 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 we're very patient with, with that. We, in fact, I tell, I tell the team, it's better to want what we don't have than have what we don't want. So let's yeah. buy right. Yeah, that's a, that's a big saying right there, man. That is, yeah, yeah. And even then, I'm sure you're like questioning it like, oh shit, we actually got one? You know, like it's going on, I'm not, you know, I'm not one to go out fishing, but you know, it's like, cast out real in, cast out real in, and then finally you got, you, know, you got something on the end of your hook and it's, it's a, you know, a carp or something, you know, like, how do you know if it's a carp or a trout, you know, like you got to do your due diligence, right? And yeah. Well, that, the one we have right, right now, we offered a uh, 1.1 million less than list on a 90 unit and he took it and we're like, Whoa, <laughs> do we miss something? You're right away. You have that. Do we miss something? But yeah, no, it's a really, yeah. really, really good deal. So we're excited about it. We close on here in the next week or so. 
That's awesome. Yeah. I, I, I know that feeling and it's unfortunate that it's, we get that feeling because it's like the market is not like it was in 2010, you know, it's completely different. It's always evolving. And there's one thing that I can hear through your whole story here is you are evolving through it. And it's been, I, I don't know who originally said it, it really doesn't matter, but in like in hockey, you don't skate to where the puck is at. You skate to where it's going. Right. And yeah. we talked a little bit about like, where do you see the market going here? And, you know, again, we don't have that crystal ball. However, every single day and just talking to people all over the country, going to meetings like the IMN conference and such and hanging with high level people, you get an idea of what's going on. You don't even, it's not like a, a big switch, like it just went off or something. It's just these little instrumental things that guide you through things. It could be a rate change. It could be a uh, population change. You know, we talked about like, how many uh, people, I was on a plane uh, to Phoenix and sitting next to this guy uh, who's a, a civil engineer for roads. And he's like, the 101 and this and that. And it was at the 101 and the 202, I think, or something. He's like, and there's a, uh, they're going to be adding a new one because there's, uh, I don't know much. You, I'm sure all this may sound somewhat familiar to you. But there's a, a, a curve um, in, the, in the road that, um, I guess it bottlenecks through that curve. I'm not sure where that's at, but they're going to try to relieve some of it. And maybe, maybe this is actually happening because it was probably about nine months. Yeah. Three, ago. yeah oh. three, 303 is coming to loop around the South, the South mountain, and, and it's already been started up on the North, but yeah, it's, there's, there's traffic issues, not like Chicago, but there, there are traffic issues. Yeah. Here. So, well, I don't know. Chicago is pretty bad. And I've been, I've been in the Phoenix area sitting there in traffic. I'm like, this sucks, man. So, uh, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's listening to sitting on a plane and talking to that guy right there. And I'm like picking his brain, like, dude, if you were in my shoes as a real estate investor, where would you, you know, where would you start to, you know, ahead of the curve? Like, where's the puck going? Right. Where I want to know these things. And it's not any one thing. It's multiple things talking to you. And that's why, you know, our listeners uh, here and, and just picking up one thing, right. Um, there's actually a book, The One Thing, too. And uh, so I know a few people have read it. It's a great book. Uh, so, Bruce, where are you at right now? Like, how many how many doors do you have right now? Okay, I'm writing down the name of that book. You said The One Thing. So yes. I'll write that down. So, yeah, th we have uh, 256 units in multifamily and ownership. And then, uh, so, you know, it's not large. We had over 400 at the beginning of the year. We've sold two buildings this year with the third one closing here in December. Um, so you know, repositioning as you will to free up some capital. And we have, uh, I think 18 condos up in Ventana Canyon left. We started with 39 just wow. over a year ago and we're, re we're fixing those and selling those retail and just peeling them off as we can. That's so awesome. those, that's the total doors with 184 currently in escrow. Wow. Well, with 30,000 people a month moving to the Phoenix metro area, you what, what I'm sure you got to know the numbers like um, what are the numbers of I mean with that many coming in like how much new construction is going on and are is it actually keeping up or is it like falling behind I mean is it with 30,000 people are you guys you know do you see the um, you know the the outgrowth of being at 20,000 a month or you know what do you see happening out there well yeah that's one of the challenges uh, some of the local Economists have, have said that there's 150,000 units needed to be built, uh, apartment units, over the next 10 years to support the demand. And we're at about 9,000 this year, which will be completed in 2019, if I remember, remember correctly. So that it hasn't been there, but that Phoenix has been boom or bust. So it, it's, gonna, it's going to happen if I think, again, it's like very cyclical where they overbuild and then they have, uh, especially the class A. We have seen some some tape, uh, peaking and even uh, price drops in some of the class A. Yeah. The challenge I see is the workforce, and that's really where our passion is: is serving the underserved. And they're not you, you can't build workforce housing unless you have a good government program, LIHTC or something like that. You know, a tax credit of some sort, because when you can buy them at 60, 50 to sixty dollars a foot, and it costs you one hundred and fifty a foot to build them, yeah. you know. Who's going to build them for 150 a foot and then rent them out for 950? It's just right. it doesn't make sense. It really doesn't, unless you've got really tiny cubicles that they live in, yeah. which obviously isn't humane. And, and we care about people, so we're going to focus on that. So I'm not sure with Phoenix. You know, three years ago we we branched out to Tucson for that reason. We were uncertain of where this is going to go, uh, but I believe a person 
to be successful in, in serving the underserved and in the workforce, th there's going to have to be some creative uh, government programs that people will need to do because the properties have been, I mean, the, all the, the rough, ugly ones have been snatched up. There's not many that are, that are really poorly run or vacant like there was yeah. in 2013, 14. Yeah. Yeah. And I've said it many times, everybody needs a place to live, work, play, or lay, man. You can't get around it, you know, and, um, and, and taking care of the, the tenant. We discussed that a little bit of, you know, by taking care of the tenant, it's, it's, you know, everybody's heard that expression of mama ain't happy, ain't nobody happy. Right. And, uh, yeah. and it's so true. You translate that into if the tenant ain't happy, ain't nobody happy. And, you know, that's why we've actually put systems in place, you know, 24 seven hotline. So when they call, there's a live person to pick up that call and answer it. So they feel worthy, you know, and then that gets shipped out to or sent out the work order gets sent out to whoever you know, it's got to go to at that point, but taking care of the tenant, like, you know, keeping them in place, you know, the value of it with the amount of doors that you have, keeping them in place increases your cash flow. Um, you don't have the vacancy. You don't have the refresh cost. You don't have the cost of putting a tenant in place. I mean, that's just huge. I can only imagine. I mean, the, the t your vacancy time has got to be down to days, not week or anything, you know, from yeah, the, back yeah vacancy vacancy is the largest um you know one cost to a, a property owner if you're not making any income and and you let's say you're asking fifty dollars too much for your unit instead of 950 you're asking a thousand and it takes you a few months to fill that unit because you're just slightly overpriced well how long does it take you to recoup that 950 that you could have received had you had it at 950 right right yeah, yeah. You're looking at 19 yeah. months. 19 months to recoup 50 bucks. So a long time, man. And that's why that's why price it competitively, bring in the right residents, and do the right screening and backgrounds, um, and just help those that that need a place to live. And and to me, it's provide a place. It's very very simple in workforce. They're not asking for high end amenities. They're not asking for dog parks. They're not asking for gyms. It, they want something that's safe, functional, durable, and clean. That's it. Yeah, that's what yeah. they're that's what they're seeking. Yeah, just be left alone, live their quiet life, just like we all do. Yeah. But you think about living in these in these apartment communities that are run by uh, slumlords. It's a problem, I and mean, we bought those, and we we enjoy buying them because we can yeah. make a difference. But wow, it, it's like how do people live in there? Like, oh, I've been here seven years, and I just put up with it because I got no place else to go. Like, well, <laughs> you actually do. Just pick yeah. up and move. And then there's but then there's those that leave because they have choices, and not many go from. Uh, barely renting to owning in the, in the life cycle of your ownership of that property. Yeah, so right. the longer you can keep the resident happy, the better your investment is. That's just to me is a Absolutely. very key principle. So Bruce, do you, you know, do you do any um, syndication? Um, are, are you, you know, looking for um, investors to uh, work with you or uh, I'm looking at this, like the opportunity is huge. Um, you, I mean, you've got a, huge opportunity in your own backyard and uh with that many people going there and the population is just growing and growing and um i look at it as opportunity like screaming opportunity um uh, you know we can we can talk offline uh, about personally but uh i'm i i shared with you a little bit about me uh but how does do you do anything as far as like maybe jv or or, or t share with the audience yeah, we've done a, a little bit of everything in that regard. Uh, joint venture, we've done a, a number of those, but we do like the small syndications, you know, million, million and a half per uh, capital raise for repositioning the properties, uh, the purchase and repairs. And there, it's typically been 18 to 36 months, sometimes a little bit longer, sometimes a little bit shorter. We had a 34 unit that we, we turned from beginning till sale, which we got an offer. It wasn't even on the market. We just got an offer and we accepted it. And that was 11 months. We did really well. Uh, and then it, it's double digit returns. You know, we target the mid teens as best we can. And, and sometimes we've been over 20 and oftentimes it's still in the mid teens and we haven't lost money on any of the apartment complexes, which we have turned. Um, so, which has been, been really, it's a good, good track record. I know we're in a good market, so that helps, but we've also run it well. We made some good decisions. Along yeah. the way. So we do, we do syndicate um, and we are currently seeking capital. So, 
that's uh, something if anybody wants to reach out, we're always willing to, to talk to them. If not this transaction, we have, you know, we'll have another one next year. So. Yeah, how, it's a good, good intro. That. How, do, how does somebody get in touch with you? Well, the, the easiest way, the, the best way to reach me is email, bruce at bakerson.com, and that's B-A-K-E-R-S-O-N, bakerson.com. And I do give out, I do have a, can give out my cell number. Not everybody calls it. It's pretty, pretty rare, actually, when I give it out, people actually call. But you can call me at 520-808-9111. And I'd gladly talk to anybody that has questions about multifamily. Yeah, have questions about multifamily, questions about syndications, questions about how to, how to treat residents right, you know, treating them with dignity. Uh, I'm willing to share uh, the, the, the little bit that I've done. Yeah. You know, and, and one thing um, that the audience would not know about you unless they know you is you really love hiking and what better place to live than, uh, than the Phoenix area to go hiking. But just share briefly like your, your last hiking trip, Max. I'm wowed by it. And I love hiking myself. Yeah, actually this last weekend on Friday, uh, Friday morning, eight o'clock, nine of us took the trek from the hermit trail at the South rim of the grand Canyon. we hiked 10 miles. Fourth, over 45 or 4,300 foot drop down to the uh, the Colorado River, and we camped under the stars uh, and, and held all of our food down. And we were the only ones. There was no humans in sight uh, from where we were. I think we met three on the way down, and then eight on the way back. And then Friday, so I was 10 miles down fr on Friday. Saturday we hiked three miles up to a plateau, camped there on a beautiful plateau, watched the sunset there, and then uh, sunrise the next morning. And Sunday we hiked the uh, seven miles back out and I tell you what if anybody has the opportunity the area we went to required permits um so they're already the, the guys that organize are already planning for next year because they fill up really fast i think january 1st they open up for the year but it's a pretty impressive trek that we did and seeing the grand canyon from the bottom is is breathtaking it's just you cannot explain it the pictures people say the pictures are beautiful and i said there is it still doesn't show the massive size of it and the beauty yeah. unbelievable That's and incredible. what's pretty wild is the last two miles was uh 2400 elevation climb so we were walking up like switchbacks wow. and steps and by the time you get to the top you're pretty pretty exhausted it was fun though i bet i bet and you would do it again next year we're i'm on the schedule for next uh next november so maybe i'll try again in may if i can get on a, another group that'd be fun but it was nice because we didn't it was is once we got up to the rim where the grand canyon village is it was just full of people. There was no parking. There was wall to wall people, and it was just like a mile away is this trailhead, which is behind a gate. You got to go beyond the gate to get it, get there. Is a trailhead. You hike down there, and you don't see anybody for three days. And this, and there's <laughs> there's thousands of people looking down. You can't even when you're down there, you can't see the people at the top. It's you know it's a mile mile deep, and they're three miles away. And wow, yeah. It's, As you can tell, it's pretty exciting. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, I, I can tell, and it, it it is. Yeah, I. I yeah, we can talk more offline. So, where do you um, where do you see yourself long term in the next like three years? We'll make it. It's not too long, but three years. Where do you see yourself uh, there? You have, you know, you have a lot of momentum going right now, and I know the market has a lot to do with you know how the next three years, um, you know, and all. But where where do you see yourself in the next three years? Our target as a company is to have a thousand units in in uh, ownership, either through joint venture partnership or syndication. Um, and then from there, you know, like, like to go to 10,000 units, uh, before I retire, if I retire. <laughs> and so the thousand units is, is the first target we're hitting and our target markets are going to be in the Phoenix Metro, uh, you know, Tucson or Arizona. And then we're going to look in, um, we got one we're working on in Texas, which is a 10 year hold. Uh, we'll look in, you know, probably Colorado, Nevada, Utah, New Mexico. Awesome. The southern states, I really like the southern states, but we understand the culture, we understand the weather, we understand the, the heating and cooling. It's yeah. a lot different here than it is in the Midwest. You know, we have, we have exposed plumbing here, and you can't do that in the Midwest. You, have, you know, you have frozen pipes and all kinds of problems. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. Uh, we're going to stick to what we know, which is, which is the southwest, and, and we love it here. Yeah, <laughs> that's awesome. And I, I, um, I know you ought to to Phoenix and there's a, a water heater in a closet outside. And you're like, huh? <laughs> this never gets that, no, it doesn't really ever get that cold ever to, to freeze. Like that's incredible. So dude, like you mentioned the rich dad, poor dad book. And I can't tell you, like, I think like every person that I 
have interviewed and has mentioned that has been one book that they read and like how powerful is that like it's just so incredibly powerful and i know have you ever played the cash flow game oh yeah we used to play years ago friends yeah. of ours we used to sit around and play that on the that evening. is yeah. such a powerful game and it's just so much fun so uh, you know if anybody's out there and they have not played the game um, i think it's just cash flow cash flow 101 or something like that um, there's two different versions as far as i know uh, it's a really great great game it's it's not you know a, a 20 dollar game it's probably like a 50 60 dollar game or something that thing will teach you um, i used to host cash flow games at different places and for people that want to be a real estate investor, just to, so they, they can get the feeling of some cash flow coming in because you got to get the hell out of the rat race, right? Yeah. So, you know, and that's like real life, you know, and, and, and even just getting involved with somebody like Bruce, um, where you don't want to, you know, be all in, both feet in, you leverage Bruce's time and his knowledge with your money and your credit and just make little instrumental moves like that like we talked earlier, and before you know it, you start growing your portfolio and, and being a part of something really cool. And depending on how aggressive you are, you can totally be out and have that financial freedom to get the hell out of somebody putting their thumb down on you and working your nine to five job. And like Bruce earlier was like, hey, sorry, running a couple minutes late. I, I got lost in time playing with my daughter. How freaking awesome is that? Like, how cool is that? I'd love to hear that. It's like, yeah, financial freedom, you know, you can, you can, you have the ability to do that. Right. And you know, they're, they're, the family's first. I mean, that's, it, you gotta, that's, that's it. So Bruce, thank you so much, man, for taking the time out of your day and just sharing. You're, you're a giver. I can tell you're just, you're, you're just permeating this, this, giving part coming out of you like you want people to succeed i mean yes it's awesome and and to the biggest givers are also the biggest gainers too in life and uh people that give 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 man are, are also the ones that are receiving and it's just that's the way it works so um thank you so much for giving everything that you have here there's so much more that we can dig deep on and and bring value but guys if there's something out there that has triggered you and you want more info give bruce a call um, he gave his cell phone number out um, how awesome is that who does that you know like incredible but um, this guy's a wealth of knowledge and i knew without a doubt just hearing this guy he knows what the hell he's talking about and uh, i just challenge you to leverage bruce's time and his knowledge with your money and your credit guys so bruce thank you so much well, thank you, Mike. I really appreciate the opportunity. I'm going to haul you around to be my cheerleader. That was, that's really nice what you said. So thank you. <laughs> All, right, brother. All right, guys. Hey, live fully, love openly, and make a difference, guys. Hey, guys. Mike Fisher here, MF Cashflow. I'm here today with Bruce Woolett, man. And this guy is out of one of my favorite cities ever. If you guys listen to me enough, you know I love the Phoenix area. And, um, he was just teasing me that he's sitting in his shorts right now and, and uh, t shirt. And, you know, I'm like, I call it bullshit on this. But guys, this guy, it, he used to live in Chicago. And uh, I think it was like he said 20 years ago, he left and, in the Chicago area. area uh, he left, and I don't blame him for never coming back. Because this is, as you guys know, if you've not been to the Midwest, it's not a place that you go to and then leave and come back. You know, it's just, it's just not. So, this guy's got a fantastic story. I, I really uh, can't wait for him to like peel it back and, and just see where he came from. Um, I just met him, what, uh, maybe about a month ago or so at a conference in, uh, in, the, in the Loop area. And uh, he was speaking and I just heard his story and I thought, man, this, is, this guy's got a great story. And I think people need to hear his story. Uh, and then also just a, a what, what play he's making in the real estate market. And uh, it's interesting enough just having a conversation with him a few minutes before this, and he and I know similar people. So it's a, it's a small world out there, and uh, but we, can, we can get to that later. Bruce, thank you so much for being a guest on the MF Cashflow. 
you know, I like to say the Mike Fisher cash flow or the motherfucking cash flow, whatever works for you, man. But, um, you know, thank you so much. And, and, you know, just, if you could just share a little bit about your story, Bruce, I, I, I I'm kind of anxious for the, for the audience to hear the story. Um, blast it out, man. Well, I'll, I'll start with the name. You know, the name of the company is, is Bakerson and I grew up in a bakery business in Minneapolis, uh, the Wallet Bakery is still in business there. And so I always tell people I'm, I'm an SOB, I'm a son of a baker. <laughs> and that gets a good chuckle. So like I said, I grew up in the bakery business and in honor of my father, uh, I named it Bakerson. He really liked that. And then a few years after I uh, started my business, he had passed away. But in, in his honor, the, the, the legacy of his name lives on in our company name. Sweet. So that's why it's Bakerson. We're, uh, and I, tell, I tease people we're still raising dough. So that's a <laughs> little fun with the uh, play on words. But yeah, I, um, like I said, I lived in Minneapolis and then Chicago and then I uh, worked my way down to Phoenix. I tried a few different uh, sales positions, uh, a couple different businesses. And then in, 2000, um, in 2001, I landed in real estate, chasing tax lien foreclosures with a friend, Gary, who also has passed away. But he was my mentor in teaching real estate and how to really dig down and find owners and and find the owner, talk to the owner was the mantra we had, and we were always uh, pursuing that. But with tax liens, he was leaving a lot of money on the table, and I said, Gary, there's other ways I can buy this uh, property. I read Rich Dad, Poor Dad, um, which is the, frankly the only one of his books I really liked. The rest of them are good, but Rich Dad, Poor Dad was pretty eye-opening just conceptually and, yeah. and get, made me think. So we got into, uh, I got into buying houses, and I bought some from Gary, my business partner at the time, and said, hey, I'm gonna buy these ones myself, fixed them up and sold them. And then uh, in 2002, I met a uh, very good friend, Jack Martin. We got to talking and, and his dad worked for my grandfather in the Willett Bakery in Minneapolis in the 60s. And so that's why we're both sons of bakers. And that's where the name came up. And uh, so Jack and I started, I was finding more houses than Jack could ever fix it, fix because he was a contractor uh, and a partner. And so I, I was introduced to wholesaling in 2000, late 2002. 2003, four, five, six, wholesale, you know, 40, 50, 60 homes a year. And when I say wholesale, it wasn't the same as what other people do where you flip contracts. We did that, but a lot of them, we took them down, cleaned them up, made them ready for the, for the investor to come in and do their work, you know, do the trash outs and the, uh, do the board ups, get rid of graffiti, clean all the weeds, make the city of uh, Phoenix was where we were, everything we were buying was city of Phoenix, made a city of Phoenix com 